Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is uh, John Abuthnot. I'm the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome some very honoured guests and their families and friends. This is a unique and, and really informal opportunity for a discussion uh, between these people and some others who have decided to come. Uh, and it's the beginning of what is going to be a very busy day for our honoured guests because uh, we have this afternoon um, uh, a graduation ceremony at the University of Edinburgh and at that graduation ceremony our three main guests are Tom Kibble and uh, Francois Anglais and Peter Higgs, Professor Peter Higgs will receive honorary degrees and Professor Peter Higgs will receive the Freedom of the City of Edinburgh and is there any other... No? Is that all for today, Peter? <laughs> yes. And we're joined this morning by the director of CERN, uh, Rolf Dieter Heuer, and he is going to address us. Could I just say that it's an absolutely unique opportunity for these three hugely distinguished people, together with Rolf Dieter, who has piloted the creation and the development of CERN to a world standing, world quality of research without which the discoveries or the ratification and endorsement of the pr predicted discoveries of these particles would not happen. So it's, it's great to have them here and it's an, a unique opportunity to have them here. Now it's a special day for this particular branch of mathematical physics and particle physics, but I could equally be addressing a group of distinguished medical people, a group of lawyers, a group of historians, um, a group of engineers. The Royal Society of Edinburgh covers all of these disciplines and is unique in these islands for that reason. So since 1783, uh, the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh has had this very broad remit. So I won't go into the details anymore. Um, just to point out that if we need to leave the building, you just follow the instructions of those around us and, and you'll be all right. We have also the great privilege of presenting to Professor Sir Tom, and to first of all congratulate him on his knighthood. I think we should just have a round of applause. I'm going to say Sir Tom as often as I can because it irritates him greatly. But, um, anyway, he um, of course has spent almost all his career with Imperial College in London. He has been a hugely loyal member of that uh, institution and has developed the discipline um, of particle physics and mathematical physics there, along with a host of colleagues over very many years. And as part of today, not only are these honorary degrees going to be awarded and the freedom of the city, but in the afternoon, we are going to present a Royal Medal from the Royal Society of Edinburgh to Sir Tom. And because it's a, a rather strange way of doing this ceremony, because we try to do it as a single item, but we have to get him to come up and sign the book on the understanding that within a few hours, he will officially have a Royal Medal in his hands. So, t Sir Tom, would you like to come and sign this? All oh, right, then. That's it. That's it. Yeah. If you just raise your head. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. And you can sit down. Just to explain that the Royal Medals of the Royal Society of Edinburgh were introduced um, at the beginning of this new millennium, uh, and they, were, they are endorsed, they are actually awarded by favour of Her Majesty the Queen, um, and so that has happened in Tom's case. So these are, not, these are very, very, very special awards, and that's the history of them. Um, so I think because we've got to get on and we want to get on with the discussion, I'm going to um, ask, uh, first of all, Rolf Dieter to come and speak, and then he will be joined on the platform by Victoria Martin, who has very kindly come to take part in this discussion. Well, that's, that's the three people, isn't it? The, right, OK. We'll deal with that later, but if you could, first of all, Ralph Dieter, give us your introductory remarks. Thank you, Sir John. I wanted to, I wanted to irritate you also a bit. <laughs> okay, um, it is, first of all, a great honor, a great pleasure to be here and to give this short presentation, but secondly, it's also a challenge because I have 15 minutes to 
don't worry, not to cover 60 years of CERN. <laughs> but we are celebrating this year 60 years of CERN, but what I will do here is I will give you a short forward look what are the plans. Yeah? But before I do that, what are we doing at CERN? We want to push back the frontiers of knowledge. We want to seek some answers, at least, to questions about the early universe. For example, and I put it into inverted commas, Newton's unfinished business. What is mass? Why can we exist at all? How do elementary particles get their mass? What is 96% of the universe made of? We just don't know. Why is there no more antimatter? That's another question why we, on why we can exist. There's no, we are in living in a matter-dominated universe. And also the secret of what was matter like within the first moments of the universe life. So these are the questions which we are addressing at CERN. And for this, we have one of our big beacons. This is the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. And this is at the energy frontier. This is at energy or energy densities never obtained by mankind before. And we had three years of running of this machine already. And the four main results which you could keep in mind here are, first of all, we have consolidated our standard model. We have done already a lot of measurements at roughly half the design energy of the machine, including very rare decays which are very sensitive to new physics. And it works beautifully. This is fantastic. On the other hand, it's very disappointing because it has a, a lot of cracks. Yeah? It doesn't explain very much. We have completed the standard model. We have discovered the messenger of the brown Angler higgs field. That is, that we have discovered the scalar boson, referred to as the Higgs boson. And it took us over 50 years of theoretical and experimental efforts. Now you have to imagine, there are two people sitting here. Higgs, Angler, then there is Braut, who has passed away. There is Kibble, there is Goralnik, who is not here, Hagen, who is not here. These six people, six people, wrote seminal papers on that. It took two times 3,000 scientists to discover the messenger of this field. So from six to 6,000. And that also explains to you why it took nearly 50 years. We have, in addition, found interesting properties of the hot, dense matter, of the, very of the matter in the very first microsecond of the universe. And number four, we have no evidence of new physics yet. And I put the yet in capital letters because I am a born optimist. We will find something, either directly when we go to higher energy or indirectly. And that's, of course, the challenge to find something and to have patience enough because it will take quite some time to find it, I'm pretty sure. So the question is, what's next? Well, I come back to these questions and I think the study of the LHC data may allow us, and I'm very careful, may allow us to answer more of the key questions. Again, can we understand this primordial state of matter? That's one of the jobs in the next 10 years, more than 10 years. And this is a, is a state of matter before neutrons, before protons could be formed. Have we found the boson that is, in inverted commas again, responsible for giving mass to all particles? And you see that C is in red, and I come back to that. Will we finally find the reason why matter and antimatter did not completely destroy each other? Or in other words, can we find the reason why we are here? Why we can be here, not why we are here, so why, can, why we can be here. <clears throat> and finally, this little embarrassment. Will we find the particle or particles that make up the mysterious dark matter? And what is dark energy? Yeah? 50 years for 5% of the universe. It's high time to go into these 95%. So the first question is, is the new particle a Higgs boson? The question, the answer is yes. ATLAS and CMS, the two big experiments, they have verified the two fingerprints of this important particle. First of all, this particle for the non, I think only the, well, the front row and the back row is particle physicists. I think in the middle there are less particle physicists as far as I can see. Um, am I correct? Yes. Yeah? Okay. 
Um, you see, this, if you have looked during the, uh, during the coffee, if you have looked at the, at the posters at the wall, you saw this um, example of the journalists which are gathering and uh, where somebody um, famous or non-famous gets through and gets the mass. So this field has a peculiarity in the sense that it has to talk, so to speak, to all, part, all fundamental particles, because otherwise it cannot give mass to these particles. So speaking a lot to a particle means the particle is heavy. Speaking very little with a particle means it's, it's, it's very light. Talking not at all to the particle means it has no mass. Okay? So, that means the lower the mass of a particle on the left bottom of this plot, the, the less the, the, the speaking frequency has to be. That means the less the coupling has to be. And if you go to higher massive particles, like on the top right, then the, the speaking frequency has to be more, higher, and therefore the particle has more mass. And that has to be, in this double logarithmic plot, more or less a, a, a straight line. And you see, it does it essentially what it should do. And in particular, um, now both experiments have also shown that the, this new boson decays not only to other bosons, that was the discovery channel, but it also decays to fermions, and these are the meta particles. So it really does the job what, which it should do. And secondly, it has a spin zero, that means it rep represents a scalar field, which is very important that it has to be a scalar field. And so therefore, it now really completes the standard model, and thus describing just barely 5% of our universe. And I say describing because I don't think it explains it. It describes it. But I told the, the people at the experiments, the discovery was easy. Now the hard work starts. It was only the beginning. What's next? Well, it is a boson of the type which we want, but is it the boson of the standard model? And in order to find out if it is the boson of the standard model, or if it is only a boson and has partners, family members, we need to pin down to measure all its properties. And if one, because this standard model provides a very good provides all the properties of this boson. So if there is one deviation, then we know it, has, it must have some friends, some relatives or so. So we have to measure exactly uh, the properties of this boson. And if the properties deviate a little bit from the prediction of the standard model, it could give information on dark matter. Because then, if it deviates, that means it also speaks to other particles which we haven't seen yet. And these could be the dark matter particles. And its properties could also give maybe first hints on the dark energy, because also dark energy is a scalar as uh, the, the, the field um, which we are talking about. So this could be very, very interesting for the next time, for the next years. And therefore, we have put up a physics program at the Large Hadron Collider beyond 2030. And that shows you this physics program. You see the years on the left top, 2015, on the right bottom, 2035. What we have done until 2014, we have just explored 1% of the amount of collisions which we want to produce with this accelerator. And that is this number 30 inverse femtobahn. Now we are planning three and a half years of running until 2018, then again one and a half years of pause and maintenance for the accelerators, another three years, another pause, another three years, etc. And in between, especially if you see in 2024, we hope that we have reached 10 times more statistics than we have accumulated up to now. But, in order, but when you have accumulated 10 times more statistics, then the doubling time to reach again a lot of statistics is very long. So what you have to do is you have to change the slope of the accumulation of the collisions. That means you have to produce more collisions per second. And in this LS3 in 2023 to 2025, we will change experiments and uh, accelerator pieces to such a way that we can produce 10 times more statistics per year. And that would bring us to the final number, 3,000 here. That means 100 times more than 
the 30 which we have now. So this is the plan for the next 20 years for this machine. But of course, it's very vital that we upgrade everything, computing, detectors, and accelerators. But that's all in the planning. But then we have to think beyond the LHC. You might think, OK, thinking 20 years ahead is fine. But we have to think further ahead, because what could, what could come next? And there, I, you have first to go back to the 1980s. 1980, in the same tunnel as now the LHC is in, there was lab already constructed and installed at that time. Then it took physics for 10 years until the year 2000. Immediately after lab was started to be built, the LHC was already discussed, design, R&D was done, then construction. And now today, we have the first physics results. And then the high, high luminosity, that means this increase in the number of collisions per year. Uh, the design has already started 2000. And now we, we will start, we will con begin with the construction in 2015, and the physics will continue, as I said, until 2035. So you, you see a clear line, but what you should keep in mind, LHC started to be discussed 1985, 1984. So it's 30 years ago. It's now time to look at the next project. And the next project could be the future circular colliders, that means going to a higher energy, in order to go to a higher energy, you, you need a larger uh, diameter ring and higher performance magnets. We had a kickoff meeting in February this year at the University of Geneva, and here you see the scope. You see the LHC is the blue ring. And what we are, this, what, what we are studying, it's not a project, what we are studying is, is an 80 to 100 kilometer ring. Actually, there's no problem at all for the Swiss people to, to build a tunnel, to dig a tunnel of uh, 80 to 100 kilometers. Uh, I mean, the, the Gotthard base tunnel is uh, three times 57 kilometers. So they told us, give us the money, we do it. Um, <laughs> the problem, of course, is what do you put into the tunnel? That you have to study. And the other problem is what physics will you uh, look for, for at the, with, such a, with such a machine. So we have a five years study set up which should have a conceptual design report ready in five years, 2018 as I said, which looks into the physics case and there of course the next few years of LHC will be very, very important to establish such a physics case. But also look into the technology, what type of magnets can you put in, how can you do it, etc., etc. And then if you study such a tunnel, you, you study everything. You look in collision, into collisions of protons, collisions of electrons. So you make a combination of all that. So you study all of that. And uh, actually, that's a very interesting study. And it's a very vital study. And it's not only done in Europe. There's also a study going on for a slightly smaller one in China now. So I think politically, things are moving from the US to China. So the competition will now be more in the east than in the west. In addition, we were also already looking into an E plus and minus linear collider along the uh, Jura Mountains, so up to 50 kilometers long. This would be another type of accelerator looking into a similar, in, again in similar questions as, as the Large Hadron Collider, but with a different view angle. So if you look only with one view, with one instrument, you get a certain result, a certain overview. If you look with a different angle in addition, you suddenly see much more. So it's like in astronomy, you only, the results you have today is only through the combination of the, or the knowledge you have today is only through the combination of the results which you get from different types of, uh, of instruments. And that's the same with us. So this is another study which we are doing. Here we are pretty far already because this, this conceptual design report is already published, but we are going on with more and more R&D to see is that the next machine or is it the round machine, the circular machine? We have to see. So beyond the LHC, we have a possibility that's of a future circular collider, maybe at CERN, a linear collider, Japan would like to build one, or if they will not do it, maybe at CERN, but of course, you can only do one of the machines. And neutrinos, I couldn't cover in that short time the neutrino question, but this is also a very interesting field. 
the US is very interested in building a neutrino facility, again, to address similar questions. And you see, if you look closely, one thing at CERN is already the LHC for the next 20 years, then something beyond. Some ideas for Japan, that means to the east, and we are collaborating with them. Something in the west, the neutrino facility, and we are collaborating with the US. So we are trying really to collaborate with all regions together in order to have the field vibrant in all three regions. But that's not all. I was talking about the LHC, and you see here the 27 kilometer circumference in, in, in yellow. There are more accelerators at CERN than the LHC. You see the blue one, the light blue one, is the super proton synchrotron. And what you can't see very well is the, the, the end of the, of the shortest arrow. There the proton synchrotron is located. So we have a lot of accelerators, and we have also the main emphasis on the high energy of frontier, that means on the LHC, we have a rich program of accelerator-based particle physics also at these other accelerators. And just to give you one idea, this is our accelerator complex. So you see now in, in, the, in the blue, the large one is the LHC, but everything starts, I have to go here, and I think I have a loud enough voice. Everything starts here, with the protons. They go into the small accelerator where they are uh, accelerated and then also formed, shaped, accumulated. Here we have a facility for these experiments. Then it goes into the next large one. Here we have a facility. Here we have a facility. Then they go into the SPS, which also has several facilities. So at each of these accelerators, which are the pre-accelerators for the LHC, we have unique experiments situated which do a lot of physics. The idea is to have one beacon, that's the LHC, but to have also a basis of scientific diversity, which is very important for many small groups, and that I think is, uh, is a healthy situation for a big laboratory like, like CERN. And this gives you the landscape of physics at CERN. I talked essentially about the high energy frontier, because that's also the topic of today. But we do a lot on the hadronic matter, hadron structure. How do these uh, particles, these composite par particles behave? Can we understand, understand the strong force better, which keeps, for example, the nuclei together? We look into antimatter. This is one of the very unique facilities which we have. Nobody else can produce antihydrogen only we have the facility to produce anti-hydrogen, and that could give a hint on the difference in the behavior of matter and antimatter. Yeah? Because we still have to understand this difference between matter and antimatter. So not only at LHC we are addressing this, but also at this very low energy, energy uh, facility. And we have quite a few experiments there. We are also having some non-accelerator experiment, but also multidisciplinary disciplinary ones on medicine and on climate uh, effects. And around 10% of the scientists which are visiting CERN, which are around 10 to 11,000, so 10% are on these smaller experiments. And I must say, we have really unique facilities in the world, and this is our scientific diversity. We are maintaining that and upgrading these facilities. So for the next roughly 20 years, we have a program at all these other facilities. So we serve a very wide community with this. I think I'm at the end of the, of the talk. My conclusion is the following. We have a European strategy for particle physics, which was approved by our CERN Council May last year. This year in May, in the US, they did also a strategy, and this was approved again by the High Energy Physics Advisory Panel. So both strategies are approved. We have the Japanese roadmap, and these three roadmaps and strategies are very well aligned. Yeah? They are looking at the same uh, uh, facilities and at the same physics, and I must say we have now, as far as I can remember, for the very first time, a global vision for our field. 
a global vision which has one peculiarity, one speciality. It goes beyond the regional boundaries. The Japanese say we participate also in Europe. We say we participate in Japan. We say we participate in the US. And the US says we participate in, in Europe. I mean, to get a written statement from the US that their highest priority is, a, is the LHC, which is not on, on US soil, is a breakthrough for a global field. So we have for the first time a global vision going beyond the regional boundaries. And CERN is playing a major role in this global endeavor. We are really, we have our hands and brains in everywhere. And I think this is very important. Thank you. Well, that was a magnificent summary and a forward look into this new world of um, understanding particle physics, uh, which um, Rolf Dieter has, has given us. Do sit down, Rolf. We can, we can move around. Ah, okay. um, I just want to be absolutely clear about explaining to you what's happening later this afternoon, because we, we have Peter Higgs and we have Francois Englert, and they will both be honoured with honorary degrees at the university, as well as um, Sir Tom uh, officially receiving his, his, his medal. So this is, this is a big issue, and Rolf Dieter also gets an honorary degree. So could I ask... Um, the other two members of the panel to come up, please, as Tom and Victoria. And I'll sit in the middle. And it's uh, open to everybody. Incidentally, all the members of the family can also ask what their family members are up to if they want to. <laughs> I'm sure that the bedtime stories have all been about particle physics. So, it's, so, <laughs> so maybe they were. Um, so I would go to kick things off by... Um, this is a, a bus saying that it's a hugely ambitious and um, far-seeing plan that you have laid up to, I think, 2035. And perhaps you could explore, to begin with, you say we have 6,000 scientists working on the programme at the moment. No? We have 6,000 working in the two big experiments. But we have altogether between 10 and 11,000 scientists coming to CERN to perform their science. In addition, we have 4,000 people on the payroll at CERN, um, which are also doing some science, but they are doing mainly engineering and uh, keeping the whole laboratory alive. So we are, I would say, a big village with more tourists than inhabitants. So the, the question is um, the capability of our science into the future for this period up to 2035, because the kind of physics you're talking about is to some extent still unexplored. Do you, are you confident that we have the people, that we will have the people? And obviously the six or 10,000 wouldn't all be there in... Not all 20. the time. So can you give us a little bit of a, a plan as to how we're going to to create this capability and maintain it? Well, first of all, this is of course, a, this is of course one of the challenges today to uh, entice the young people and to, uh, for such a science, uh, for science in general, I must say, and then not only to entice them, but also to keep them then. Yeah, that's very important. Now, <clears throat> first of all, what I couldn't show because the time was too short, is the age distribution of our visiting scientists and it peaks at 26. It peaks at 26, which is fantastic, and it has a real peak. Yeah? It's, it's really a resonance, I must say. As a scientist, I would say it's a clear, um, it's a clear signal. Um, and this is mainly the PhD students, of course, yeah? not the German ones. They peak at the higher, uh, but okay, that's, uh, that's a different story. Um, and we have around 3,000 PhD students at the moment performing their thesis at these big and all the experiments at LHC, 3,000. So these guys are, of course, our future. But then... They will be close to retirement when we are, when we are having something in, in 30 years. We are having quite a few programs at CERN to help to re-motivate teachers. We are doing, uh, next week I, I inaugurate a new, a new small laboratory for school classes to do some, some experiments. It's called School Lab, and the School Lab is an S apostrophe cool. You have to use modern language. As apostrophe, I don't know, apostrophe or yeah, in the, uh, cool yes. um, lab. Um, we are having 
This year I inaugurate also a beam line for schools. That means we, we give two weeks at one of the, uh, at one of the accelerators to a school project. Oh, really? Yes. And we had across Europe? From across the, the world. Right, across the world. We had 292 fantastic proposals. They were judged by our scientific committees, like the normal experiments. And we had two winners, um, one uh, group from a school from uh, uh, um, Netherlands and one group from a school of, of uh, in Greece. And because they were both the best ones, obviously. And these guys, they will not compete in these two weeks. They will already collaborate. So they, are, they learn already during uh, the development of the, or the, the writing the proposal. They have already learned how a collaboration works. Right. And I, I met, the, I was in Amsterdam yesterday. And I met the, the, the people from that school. And they are not coming from the same school class even. They were from the same class. So the, they were mixing already at the school. This is fantastic. Then we have uh, things for young, young guys uh, between seven and nine, mm -hmm. a program a slip into the skin of a researcher. So they have to write down how they imagine a, research, a researcher or they have to um, do a drawing. And then afterwards, they, so this is full of, full of fantasy. I mean, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and then they visit CERN. Yeah. And afterwards, it's boring. They have to do it again. And then they see how uh, that a scientist is a normal human. Right. So we have a lot of these programs. So you are, you're, you're confident. So I'm going to yeah. turn to Victoria now because you mentioned young people. And I can disclose, although I shouldn't say this, that uh, Victoria has been elected as a member of the Young Academy of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Thank you. You Thank didn't you. hear what I said no, there. No, um, <laughs> um, I do know. <laughs> and you also are monitoring... Um, what's happening in this field very actively. Yeah, so actually I'm, I work on or collaborate on one of the experiments at the LHC on ATLAS. So we have a group of 25 of us in Edinburgh that work on that and also my colleague Franz who's in the audience and when we as a group on the one of the other experiments so there's about 40 of us in Edinburgh work at CERN. So would you like to take this prediction from Rolf Dieter and are you confident that we, over the next, up to 2035, we can do this? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, the, the science and the engineering, there's a, there's a very good case. What I've been working on recently, actually, is making the physics case. You know, it's one thing to say that we can do it. It's another thing to say, you know, is it worth doing it? Is it worth doing it? Are we going to get the science out? And um, yes, indeed, it is worth doing it, and it is worth... Um, getting the science out. That's what we've been studying recently. Um, for the people, I mean, I've been speaking to school teachers in Scotland recently, and actually the reason I have been is that we're adding particle physics to the higher curriculum, the new uh, curriculum for excellence, higher curriculum. And we have great physics teachers in Scotland, and I think that's going to inspire young people in Scotland to study physics, and maybe not just physics, we, we still need engineers and mathematicians and computer scientists to do the science at CERN. And um, I think the future is pretty rosy for um, being able to have good scientists coming out of Scotland and, and the rest of the Europe and the rest of the world to keep doing this, this science. I'm going to now turn, and there's microphones for people to participate in this, but I, I'm going to now turn to, first of all, Tom, and then to ask um, either Peter or Francois to comment, because you guys started this business a long time ago, <laughs> a long time ago, and it's, it must be an unbelievable dream now. Um, what do you, how do you see the future? Well, it's been very exciting, of course, this development of uh, um, verifying things that were first speculated about so many years ago. Uh, but there are, as um, Professor Hoyer mentioned, there are lots of um, things we don't know, things that are unexplained. Um, and we really do want to see something else uh, something new that will help to guide the next stage in our theorizing. Um, I mean, for example, it would be really wonderful if somebody found some evidence for supersymmetry, but I understand that 
the evidence, if anything, has rather declined. Um, Supersymmetry is a wonderful idea, but it, there is absolutely no right. empirical evidence for it. Um, it would make a big difference if it were there, because it's the basis of, of string theory, among other things. Yes. Interesting. Francois, would you like to comment on the, on the future? The future? Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not my future, but I will, uh, <laughs> will uh, maybe comment. Well, uh, first it was a, a wonderful talk about uh, what we saw. And, um, but maybe I have a, a little mm. remark with this. That it, it is on the sense true, of course, that we know only 4% of the universe, as you said. But there is perhaps another way to state it, that th there are two things that we don't know in this area namely the dark energy and the dark matter. So, <coughs> and I think <coughs> this raises both some optimistic and pessimistic right. point of view, right. if you wish. Namely, that as far as the dark matter is concerned, hopefully this is just a particle that we have not seen. Right? That would be the for this point, the optimistic. But for the dark energy, I think it's all, there it's both optimistic and pessimistic. I don't think the point is really, the, the, the relevant point is not that it's 70% of, of the mass, but it is something that is we don't understand. And as far as I'm concerned, I think the answer for this problem lies in quantum gravity. Because it doesn't look that one always thinks that quantum gravity is something that acts on very small distances. Yeah. However, this is an example, in my opinion, well, maybe I'm wrong, of course, that is not the first time it happened in my life. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you see, the problem is this, that, uh, that uh, uh, of course, it looks to be something that is very long range and something like this that happens all over the world. Right. But the simplest interpretation of it would be that it looks like a cosmological constant. Maybe some deviation, but I've not yet seen. So something like a cosmological constant. But the problem with the cosmological constant is that we know that we don't understand why the simple fields that we have all around don't give, uh, well, they should, according to quantum mechanics, give a very large cosmological concept. They're not there. So you could always say you can fix it by just, by hand, choosing that constant. That you can do in theory, which are consistent in field theory. Re general relativity is not. And therefore, I think the problem basically is something that has to do with quantum gravity. Mm. That raises a new kind of type of experiment, which are very important. Some of them have been done. Uh, some recent contestable mm. things have been found in the, which are very interesting, which has been found in the, in the uh, South Pole. But uh, I think, unfortunately, they also, it requires something which is not easy to find, it's human intelligence. Sure. And uh, because there is there a problem which basically, I think, will be a fundamental theoretical type of understanding. And uh, it has to be done, unfortunately, I think, without much uh, experimental evidence. Okay. Peter, would you like to comment? Well, I, I don't think I, I have uh, much to add to what Francois has said. I, I mean, we're, we're both really the same kind of theorist after, after all. And uh, I, I mean, I, I, I too still pin my hopes on uh, some kind of supersymmetry being discovered through the, the next phase of the experiments because that's the only way I, I know, know of at the moment in, in which we could get the, the sort of final unification at, between the forces of particle physics and, and gravity and 
tie up these, all these questions about the relationship of what particle physicists do to the universe in the large. Um, so I, 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 I hope to survive long enough to see some interesting results come through, but whether they will come first from CERN or whether it will be from some of the other complementary experimental mm. programs, I, I don't know, because there are, there are people looking for dark matter candidates in other ways in uh, underground experiments and experiments buried in the Antarctic ice and so on, and some of the first hints of what, what's in store may, may come fr from, fr from that uh, r rather than CERN. We don't, we don't know. Also, as uh, uh, Rolf has said, the uh, uh, American program I I is emphasizing the uh, role of neutrino physics, and there again is a, a program which is complementary to what CERN does, and uh, neutrinos are the prime example of, of the failure of a simple standard model from a long time back because neutrinos don't fit, don't fit very well. They, they don't, a standard model theorist would not anticipate that they have some mass. So there are interesting things to come in from these other complementary fields. Yeah. Uh, so I, I look forward to the, the next few years, if I'm around, with great interest. So I'm, I just, we, we don't have that much time, but I think there's two main aspects still to be discussed. And um, I think Rolf has presented his, his dream very clearly in terms of what the physicists can do. What the challenge here is um, what, can, what can theory do? And, um, you know, that's a very, very important question. I'm going to ask... Uh, Victoria, in terms of the young people who are coming through, I mean, have we got the right mix to do both of these things? That's a very good question. Um, and certainly the, the students that we have at university, we have a, a good mix between e experimental students that are very good in the lab and um, very good theoretical physics. So, it, it, I mean, it seems to me that we do have a good mix, but whether anyone's going to make a prediction that's going to be so groundbreaking as that these three gentlemen and, and others made, I, I don't know. I hope so, because, because I'd still, I'd, it's been great to discover one particle. It would be nicer to discover even more. Right. And I think the, the last point I think I was going to make was, um, coming back to Rolf's presentation, this is a worldwide effort. Um, and it was very interesting that you said that perhaps there was more of a, um, an emphasis on the work that's going to come, or at least the collaboration that's going to come from China than from the United States. And I think we sh should ask you to expand on that a bit because there are political dimensions to these things. Do you want to comment? A bit uh, with some hesitation, of course. <laughs> um, In the US, it's, it's very easy to stop a program. It's very difficult to start a program. Yeah. That's one of their problems. And up to now, they have stopped programs where they had international partners without consulting the international partners very much. Mm -hmm. That changes now. They are learning that international means something else than they thought for some time. They, we have good indications, and we are discussing with them very often. So I have some hope that this is going well. So that removes one obstacle. The other obstacle is, of course, the support for science. And I have the impression that China wants to become a main pl player in the field. Money doesn't play any role. Uh, people, they have enough. Maybe not enough people of the the type we are just discussing. I'm, I'm Not happy, enough. I'm happy to go to China. <laughs> oh, and, and no, no, I, even I, I, younger I, I, than I, me. No, no, I didn't, <laughs> want, I, I didn't, I didn't want to, to trigger that, so don't worry. We can arrange no. that. Um, so they still need our expertise, and, and, and uh, so maybe you stay here, but okay. Um, so we have to see, but uh, since resources don't play a big role, I can see them coming up very quickly if they want to do something. My worry is that they would like to do it more 
nationally than globally. And I think that would not be very good for the field. The field, the field has shown that it can work together internationally since quite some time. And we are just evolving into a really global view in a global field for the... F and I think we are at a very interesting period in, in, in that sense. And we have to maintain that. So this is a little bit my worry here. And, uh, but we have to stick together globally. Well, uh, we've had a very short time. We could, uh, this would, could have been really a, a tremendous uh, day-long um, discussion, but we have to move on. And I'm pleased to say that the three, um, the three founders of this field, uh, to, together with uh, Rolf Dieter, are now going to play, pay tribute to James Clark Maxwell, who, um, if you like, pre predeceased preceded us all in this area. And uh, he has a statue not far from this building. And if, unless it's raining, I don't know if it's raining. It uh, never, I thought it never rains in Scotland. No, it never does. <laughs> no. The water comes from somewhere else, ah, it's not rain. Um, so we're going to go to the statue and have some photographs and then um, have some lunch and then go to the University of Edinburgh for further celebrations, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well,